next speaker is from UCLA, Angelica Morales. Thank you, Angelica. Yeah. Talking about the brain structure of methamphetamine dependence. Amphetamine tank stimulants, which include methamphetamine, are the second most commonly used illicit drugs worldwide, second only to cannabis. And currently, there are no approved medications for um, amphetamine tank um, addiction. Because of this, we're left with behavioral therapies like contingency management and cognitive behavioral therapy, but the success of these treatments may depend on the structural and functional integrity of the brain so that the person can fully engage with the treatment. Um, there's an emerging literature suggesting that differences in the structural integrity of the brain and plasticity may influence behavior. With this in mind, several studies have used structural magnetic resonance imaging to try to understand how methamphetamine-dependent individuals differ from healthy controls. The first of these studies was conducted in 2004 by doctors Lon London and Thompson at UCLA. This is a map of the percent deficit seen in methamphetamine-dependent individuals. The areas in red indicate that there was approximately a 5% deficit in gray matter density in the meth users when you compare them to the healthy control participants. And the areas in blue indicate that there were no differences between the groups. And there were statistically significant differences in the anterior cingulate seen here and in the hippocampus, which isn't pictured. This study was conducted a little bit later, and they found that methamphetamine-dependent individuals had a deficit in gray matter density in the middle frontal gyrus. In this study, um, density in the middle frontal gyrus in the methamphetamine-dependent individuals was correlated with performance on a Wisconsin heart sorting test, which uh, measures cognitive flexibility. And the last example I want to show you is of this study. Um, they found that methamphetamine-dependent individuals had less gray matter de density in the insulin than healthy controls. So from these studies, we can see that a general pattern begins to emerge. In general, methamphetamine-dependent individuals have less gray matter in the cortex than healthy controls. Um, but there's still a lot of variability across all these studies as far as the specificity of the brain regions involved. So thinking about why this may occur, um, we thought of two factors. The first is that in all these studies, the MA-dependent samples smoked cigarettes more than the control samples. And the second was that across these studies, the range and average duration of abstinence varied greatly. In some of these studies, people who've been abstinent for methamphetamine for a couple of days were grouped with individuals who were abstinent from methamphetamine for almost two years. And they were all included in this one, presumably homogeneous group, which it wasn't. Um, so we started to wonder if tobacco smoking and um, abstinence from methamphetamine were affecting our measurements of gray matter in methamphetamine-dependent individuals. Um, we know that 87 to 92% of individuals who use Stimulants also smoke cigarettes. And interestingly, stimulant abusers who also smoke cigarettes tend to have more legal and drug use problems. We also know that cigarette smoking is associated with reductions in gray matter density and volume in various brain regions. This is an example from a study done in 2001, and they found that compared to non-smokers, or actually never smokers, they had their control group had smoked fewer than five cigarettes a lifetime, individuals who smoke daily had less gray matter density frontal cortex than those who don't smoke at all. Um, this finding has since been replicated and extended to other parts of the prefrontal cortex, parietal cortex, and the temporal cortex. So this suggests that if we don't properly control for cigarette smoking, um, differences or um, gray matter abnormalities associated with cigarette smoking may incorrectly be linked to other drug use like methamphetamine. Like even less is known about how abstinence from methamphetamine may influence um, gray matter volume in the brain. However, we do know that with abstinence, things in the brain are changing. So in this study, um, Nora Volkov showed that um, between early and late abstinence periods, dopamine transporter availability increased in the cotic nucleus. And in this study, they showed that relative metabolism in the thalamus increased between short and protracted abstinence. Um, so with that in mind, the goals of the line of research I'm going to present today were to differentiate the effects of cigarette smoking from smoking alone, uh, to differentiate the effects of cigarette smoking alone from the combined effect of methamphetamine abuse with a cigarette smoking on gray matter volume. Our second goal was to measure changes in gray matter volume with abstinence from methamphetamine, and our third goal um, was to determine how gray matter volume relates <coughs> to impulsive behaviors. To answer the first question, we recruited 18 controlled non-smokers. These people had self-reported smoking fewer than five cigarettes in their lifetime. 
25 control smokers that had to smoke at least daily, and 39 people who met um, DSM-4 criteria for methamphetamine dependence on the skin. And these people all also smoked cigarettes daily. The methamphetamine dependent group had to be abstinent for four to seven days before they underwent high resolution structural magnetic resonance imaging. So this is just a demographic table to show you how the groups compare. You can see that in general, they're fairly well matched in age, gender, mother's education, and tobacco use. Um, in general, the methamphetamine dependent sample um, is pretty, like they use pretty heavily. Um, in this case, they used on average 22 out of the 30 days preceding study entry, and they used about two and a half grams of methamphetamine per week. The groups also didn't differ in alcohol use in the 30 days preceding study entry, but they did differ on the frequency of marijuana use. In particular, the methamphetamine dependent individuals used marijuana more frequently before they entered the study than either of the control groups. Um, because of this, um, all the results that I show you have included marijuana as a covariate in the statistical model. So here are the results. You can see that um, controls who smoke cigarettes and methamphetamine dependent individuals who also smoke cigarettes both have deficits in gray matter in the orbital frontal cortex when compared to individuals who don't smoke cigarettes. But when you directly compare the MA dependent cigarette smokers to the control smokers, you find that the methamphetamine dependent individuals have less gray matter volume in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, in the insula and the superior temporal gyrus, um, in the precuneus, and in the supermarginal gyrus of the parietal cortex. To answer the second question about how gray matter changes with abstinence from methamphetamine, we recruited um, 12 healthy control individuals and 12 methamphetamine dependent individuals. In this case, both the groups were matched for cigarette smoking. And participants who were methamphetamine dependent came to UCLA and they stayed at the hospital for approximately a month. They received their first scan during the first four to seven days of abstinence, as I described previously, but they just then received a second scan after approximately three weeks. The controls participated as outpatients, but they underwent two scans in the same time period. During the time that they were at the hospital, the methamphetamine dependent individuals were asked to abstain from using methamphetamine, and we verified applied that with urine screening. Um, and, but they were still allowed to smoke cigarettes. And what you can see in these maps are the results. Um, areas in um, yellow and green indicate regions where there is approximately no change over the 30 days. Um, you can see that in the controls, most of the brain is yellow and green. There were no statistically significant differences between time one and time two in the control sample. But in the methamphetamine dependent sample, you see a lot of blue, indicating that gray matter volume increased over the three weeks. Um, particularly in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, again in the superior temporal gyrus and insular cortex, and in parts of the parietal cortex. <coughs> um, with that in mind, our final goal was to determine how gray matter volume relates to impulsivity. Um, previous studies have been conducted in healthy controls, and they show that, um, in this study in particular, they showed that this cluster here in yellow um, was correlated with impulsive behavior. It was specifically a scale of motor impulsivity, and individuals who had less gray matter volume in the orbital frontal cortex reported more impulsive behaviors. Um, so with that in mind, we looked to see if the gray matter volume of the orbital frontal cortex was related to impulsivity in the MA-dependent sample. Um, so again, here we have our three groups, but we've increased the sample size um, in all of the groups, and they, all participants completed the broad impulsiveness scale, the scale asks people to endorse or to endorse the extent to which certain items apply to their own behavior, and items include things like I plan things carefully or I act without thinking. And what you can see is that as you expect, the methamphetamine dependent sample self-reports more impulsivity than either of the control samples. Unlike previous studies, though, we didn't find a difference between the control non-smokers and the control smokers. And these are the um, correlations. We didn't find any significant correlations between orbital frontal cortex volume and impulsivity in the healthy control samples in either of them. But we did find that in the methamphetamine dependent sample, um, more gray matter volume in the medial and lateral OFC was associated with less self-reported impulsivity. Um, so in sum, um, these findings show us that some gray matter volume deficits seen in MA-dependent individuals 
are in part attributable to cigarette smoking or to pre-morbid conditions that may promote addictive behaviors. Um, we showed that increased gray matter in methamphetamine abstinence, we showed increased gray matter with abstinence from methamphetamine, suggesting that at least some of the abnormalities seen in MA dependent individuals may be attributable to methamphetamine use itself. Um, and we showed that impulsive behavior being methamphetamine dependent individuals is related to gray matter deficits in the orbital frontal cortex. This study, like all studies, is not without its various limitations. Um, the first is that it's really difficult to match controls and meth users on you know, a variety of lifestyle factors. But there are things that we're starting to consider now in the lab that we hadn't considered previously. Like, for example, with amphetamine dependent individuals experience more childhood trauma, and that may be related to gray matter volume. And those are things we're looking into controlling better in the future. Um, the other I think the main limitation of this work is that we have no way of knowing whether the longitudinal sample is representative. Um, these were people who were willing and able to maintain abstinence on their own without being mandated to do so at UCLA. And it's not clear the extent to which these findings would generalize to other populations of MA dependent individuals. In the future, we hope to extend this work to see if interventions can hasten recovery. Um, in particular, the lab has already started examining how exercise might influence the brain, and I'm interested in how exercise might help increase hippocampal vampire volume in methamphetamine-dependent individuals. We're also interested in um, cognitive training. Um, I'm sure most of you know that cognitive training involves playing computer games that are supposed to improve your attention, working memory, executive functioning, and we hope to see if um, cognitive training can improve cognitive function in methamphetamine-dependent individuals and whether those improvements are related to structural and functional changes in the brain. With that, I'd like to acknowledge all the members of the London Lab that helped with this work and our funding sources, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Henry? Oh. Angelica, this is a wonderful story. This is a very nice story, and the graphics are also lovely on that last slide. Um, the question is, have you thought about the relationship between gray matter volume and the effects on gray matter volume that are thought to occur in other psychiatric diseases and with psychiatric medications? And is it possible that you could look at the acceleration of recovery in the methamphetamine abstinent patients, uh, subject, if you also put on board the antidepressant? We would probably have to do that in collaboration with other groups at UCLA who are using treatments. Um, in, as far as psychiatric diagnoses, um, all of these participants are screened, and we exclude anybody who has any diagnoses except for methamphetamine dependence and cigarette dependence. Um, so actually, that's another reason the sample may not be entirely representative, because we know that substance use is comorbid with all kinds of other things, and we've excluded that from the sample to get sort of the, the, more specific effect of the effect. fact that you have excluded psychiatric patients means that you will be able to have a clear and pure experiment on whether you can accelerate the increase in gray matter with a pharmacological intervention in addition to the, the brain on the treadmill or the brain on the EKG. Yeah, something to think about for sure. Any other questions? Very nice.